What kind of streamers are there, and why do digital audio equipment differ in audio quality? A registration of my presentation during the Noir et Blanc Bruxelles Hi-Fi Show 2022. November 5th and 6th, my colleague Jaap Veenstra of AlphaAudio.net and myself were asked to do a presentation on the Noir et Blanc Bruxelles Hi-Fi Show 2022. I was already asked if a video registration of my presentation would become available. I didn't expect it to be registered, but Jaap was also very kind to register and edit not only his very interesting presentation on Networks for Audio, but also my presentation. A link to his presentation is in the top right corner at the end of this video and in the show notes. We had to work in a rather noisy hall, so I'm slightly less focused than normal. Enjoy. I will try to tell you a bit about network players, um, how the structure is of network players, but also why some network players sound different than others. A lot of things, a lot of people think that bits are bits and that all digital equipment sound the same for that reason. That's not true, but I'll come to that later on. Um, I'm often asked like, these, these two questions. Um, um, what kind of streamers are there? Um, where do they store their information? How many information can they store and all that? That's the first thing I will handle. And the second is, as I said, uh, the sound difference between digital players. To start off with um, the first question, let's see what components there are in a streamer. It's quite abstract, but you'll get the point when I'm finished. You have, of course, storage. That can be a hard disk, that can be a USB drive, uh, that can be uh, even a CD. Um, then you have something that has to control the information flow. Um, you have a database that contains the uh, information about the music, so the, the album name, track name, uh, artist, composer, all that information. And you have a user interface, so you can instruct the machine what to play. And you have what I call here the renderer, that's anything from the end of where it is digital to um, the loudspeakers. When you start up a device, it starts to query the, uh, the hard disk, uh, reads all the files, all the metadata, and um, it reports back, and that is then stored in the database. The uh, database then can feed the information back to control. That can feed the user interface, where the user can ask for a certain track and then uh, that's uh, sent back to control and it will send the music. This is, in fact, what all digital players do. It all started with computers. Uh, the old computer of, of, of me went to my son. He discovered he could play music with it uh, on his uh, PC speakers and he was very happy. There's a difference between um, a computer and um, a music player. Is in, in that the uh, computer uses a file system and not a database. It's a, it, it is a database, it's a simple da database, but it doesn't contain more information about the music. So uh, artists, uh, album names, they're all not in the, the, the file system of, of a computer, as you can see here. The next thing that happened was to uh, bring the DA conversion outside of the computer because in the computer it is really very poor uh, sound quality uh, that can be fed over a spit of a USB at that time. Nowadays there are even more standards. And the next, step is, 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 net, the next step was to use a music player software that can index the music, um, the, the composer, the, 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 the artist, the, the album art and all that, and create its own database in the computer. That can be done in several ways. Uh, the first way to do it is uh, server-based. Then you have uh, in the computer uh, a program running that uh, works as a music server. 
that builds the database, and you have an external network player that uh, gets the information from that database and uh, receives it over the internet, over the network, and uh, feeds it to uh, to the renderer. And that can is usually controlled by a smartphone or tablet. Uh, in the old days, you had dedicated uh, remote controls, but not here. There are several systems that can do that. Uh, the most used is uh, UPnP AV uh, and DNA. UPnP AV and DNA are in fact the, the same, it's, uh, as such that UPnP AV was f first there, and then the big companies like Philips and uh, Sony, who owned a lot of uh, copyrights on music too, said, "Well, we don't want it, the, the MP3s to play." So they came with a version that denied anything that had copyright or was mp3 and that was called DNA. So if you hear DNA, uh, it's the same as UPnP AV, especially since nowadays those, those copy protection is all banned. <coughs> the second system is a Logic, Logitech Media Server with the squeeze box and then there are brand specific uh, um, devices like Sonos, Yamaha and Relic. I will have them pass uh, by one by one. DNA UPnPAV is very wide accepted uh, by the consumer electronics industry. All well-known brands, brands like um, Rands, like um, Denon, like um, uh, Hegel, I think also, Cambridge Audio, Arcam, uh, Lin, they all use um, uh, DNA as, as a protocol and as a server. Um, it supports audio, but also video and photos. If you have photos and videos on your computer and you have a smart TV, you can watch, using the same protocol, those photos and videos. Um, there needs to be a server program, it's a small program, on a, on a computer or a NAS. It's a very small program and it's, uh, it can be done on a very cheap NAS. I have uh, one of my, my test equipment is a 100 euro NAS that performs well. It's not the quickest, but it works well. Many servers that use a very limited support for metadata. You usually can get the artist, you can get the album name, but comp Composer often isn't supported and, and so on. There are good programs like Minim Server that is free and does only audio and supports all the metadata. And uh, there is no provision for gapless playback. So if you play, for instance, uh, Sergeant Pepper, you get uh, a short silence between the tracks. That is nowadays solved in good hardware. So if you use DNA and you're going to buy new hardware, make sure that it's uh, capable of playing uh, gapless. These are the brands that support the DNA standard, and there are many more, but to give you an idea how, how big this is. The next one was um, uh, the squeeze box. Um, it was bought by Logitech at the moment that it got successful, and Logitech has abandoned it, but has promised, promised to, um, to maintain the server program uh, so people with a squeeze box can still use it safely. And um, it's partly open source, so you can have play, uh, plugins for all kinds of applications like Tidal, Cobus, uh, Spotify, all those things are supported, uh, internet radio. Um, it supports music, video, and audio too, and, uh, and, and photos. And it's free, the server program is free. And since you can't buy uh, squeeze boxes anymore, the solution is to buy a Raspberry Pi with a, s a simple sound card. And if you're handy with a computer, you can, you can make that uh, uh, function as a squeeze box. Then you get the self-indexing in streamers, and those are uh, different from the ones I showed you before in that there is no database in the computer. There is a file system that knows where the files are, but there is no database that tells you what track is made by what artist and so on. That is done in the network player itself, and that has the advantage that it's very fast. Um, And it can be remote controlled like DNA is. There are um, three brands that are rather popular. 
uh, Sonos is uh, very wide in the market and uh, is well, well known. Then you have Blue Sound, and if you want Blue Sound at a higher quality, it's done by the sister company um, uh, NAD. And Aurelic is another brand, in, but that's uh, again higher in the market that, that works this way. Let's, let's look at Sonos. Sonos is easy to install. I once wrote that my mother could install it, and it's really, really true. Um, fast browsing and searching for music. It has a large install base, so when a streaming service uh, wants to hit the market, they really have to be friends with Sonos. So it's supported, supported about any streaming service all over the world. Um, the internal memory defines how many tracks you can index. And that has to do with the amount of metadata. If the memory is full, the database can't grow anymore and you're on the limits. How much that is depends on the, the amount of uh, metadata you use. If you only have the artist and the album name in the, in the file, it's limited. If you have very large images of the, 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 uh, the cover art, then it's, it, it gives a burden on the memory, of course. One thing is it's a closed system. If you really want to work with Sonos, you have to buy other Sonos equipment to, to get a bigger installation. And um, quality-wise, it's targeted at the average consumer. Let me define that by saying the people that don't come here. I think that's safe. If you want one step, uh, oh, um, there's one thing, the mesh network. That's an interesting feature. For when, there was an interesting feature 10 years ago. Uh, when you I had more Sonos devices, and I was la lazy to draw uh, five of the same, but it can be speakers as well. The moment you connect um, one device, it starts connecting all other devices it see, sees, and so extend the network, and th this is exclusive for Sonos. And um, that made it a very robust system in the days that you only had one access point in your house. Nowadays, there are repeaters for little money, and uh, most people have a very good coverage throughout the house. So this is not a real feature anymore, not an important feature anyway. Uh, a lot the same is Blue Sound. Blue Sound is a, is a brand that uh, came, I believe, eight years after Sonos, and they looked very carefully at what Sonos did, and they tried to be at a higher sound level, and um, I think they succeeded quite well. Uh, again, it's a very easy install installation, it's uh, self-indexing like Sonos. It has uh, a smartphone or tablet or a computer to uh, operate it. You can also co uh, operate it from a computer. Um, the primary controls are on the device, meaning that you can set the volume or lower the volume on the device or uh, pause it or select the next track. And some models even have uh, a preset, so when you get out of bed in the morning and you press one, it starts your favorite radio program. And in the evening when you're uh, with a glass of wine on the couch, you can press three and it plays your favorite playlist. Uh, it works uh, as, as the, the Sonos system with a share on your, on your system, as I showed you in the diagram. Um, you have to share a part of your hard drive where your music is and uh, it will get the music from there. There's a model with an integrated amplifier, and there's a model with an integrated hard disk and uh, CD drive so you can rip it. There's not a model that has all these three things. If you want a higher, even higher uh, sound quality, you can have a NAD player that uses the same uh, uh, blue sound technique, but has a higher quality audio. There is uh, something that is called cell storing and uh, indexing. In, fa in fact, we're talking about a, uh, a phone, for instance. Um, so it stores the information on the smartphone or tablet. It, um, it has a sound quality that depends on the operating system. Some operating systems, like um, uh, Android, convert every audio to 48 kilohertz, and uh, the conversion always uh, gives a loss in audio quality. Uh, sound quality depends on the hardware. That some phones sound better, some iPads sound better than others. Um, it's very easy to install, of course, but it's not always a bit perfect. 
using a bit perfect play player and Android has some bit perfect players can be a solution but still in most cases you're limited to 48 kilohertz in case of an external renderer in the, in case of the, 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 you want quality an external renderer is is a good thing so an external DAC in, the, in this case or use uh, uh, airplay or, or um, uh, the Google uh, Google cast uh, system Chromecast system to get the music to a, a better playback system. Short uh, about Apple AirPlay, it's um, if you have a, U a Windows computer, iTunes isn't that great on, on a Windows computer, and um, um, it's a very robust uh, streaming protocol. It's it's protected also very well, and it's licensed by many brands. So you can most AV receivers support uh, iTunes as a streaming format. Uh, it's a closed system on, on the front end, meaning that the music you play has to, have, it has to be your own music on your computer or come from Apple Music. You can't use Tidal or Cobus or Amazon or what, what you want. Uh, it won't do that. The unit looks like this, a lot of the units look like, like this, but it's integrated in a lot of amplifiers and AV receivers. You can also use a, a network bridge if you, if you don't want... Uh, uh, one of the other systems. This network bridge uh, can be a lot of things. It can be a, a rune endpoint, it can be um, an HD and a DNLA endpoint. It, it does the squeeze box, so you can use all kinds of protocols with it. And it's in fact a, a USB uh, or SPDIF at a distance. So you put the computer in the living room or, or on the, in the computer room and, and such a box in uh, the living room and connect it to your hi-fi and you don't have any problems with the sound of the computer that the, 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 the forced cooling does and this is uh, silent both acoustically and electronically so it sounds better the last uh, variant is the, uh, the, the cloud storing and indexing in fact uh, there are many ways to do that um, uh, the, the, but the database and the music files are in the cloud uh, as I said, all, all the streaming services work that way. Um, it's played via network player, computer or smartphone or tablet. And a separate renderer can be used. It looks like this if you look at the diagram. It's, it's not that different from uh, the computer that's used as a storage. Uh, only now it's in the cloud. Devices that support it are like this. The middle one is uh, out of production. Uh, but again, the protocol is supported by many uh, current uh, uh, audio equipment. Then we want to talk about why digital equipment can sound different from other digital equipment. To do that, I'm going to explain you first how digital works. You probably know that, but it's a good repetition. Uh, to, to do that, I found an audio so signal that looks like this. It's most unlikely that ever uh, an audio signal will look like this, it's a straight line, but in the end you will understand why I do this now, this now and it's the same for real uh, audio waves. If you want to digitize this, what is done is at equidistant times every 44,100 times per second, per sec per second uh, the, the amplitude is, is measured, how strong, how many volts is the signal at that moment. It looks like this. And those values are stored in a table. And uh, that can be stored on any medium or can transport it on any medium you can think of. On playback, that is read in again. And those values are plotted again. And in the beginning of the um, digital era, you uh, were shown this diagram um, to prove that the digital signal was converted to analog. I can assure you that this sounds horrible. Um, and this is not what is happening. That's because um, Nyquist, Mr. Nyquist has already defined that if you digitize something, you have to filter it at half the sampling rate. If you do that, the pen that draws this becomes slow because of the filtering. It can't do 44,000 jumps, can only do 20,000 jumps. What you then get is a straight line. 
And that's what's happening, in theory at least. Um, in practice, the filtering is one of the problems, but I get back to that. If those values are not plotted on the right time, you don't get a straight line back. That's why you use a straight line. If I uh, put a, a white line behind it, you can see that the red line is not straight anymore. And this is uh, this, what you see here is called jitter. It's one of the forms of jitter. There are many forms of jitter. This is uh, caused by just one uh, interfering frequency. Uh, how come? Well, it can be uh, an instable clock. Um, clocks, uh, the, 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 those are crystals. And you, ha you have them that cost uh, a quarter of a dollar. And you have them that cost $50. You have them that cost $100. And that, of course, is a, is a quality difference. And it's not in the construction. But what they do is they build a lot and they measure the best one out. And you have to pay extra for that. And uh, the ones that don't measure good are yeah, dumped on the market for a low price. And that's what you get in cheap equipment. Therefore, those people that say, well, I've seen this Chinese DAC from 100 euros and it has uh, the same. Uh, ESS 9028 DAC chip in it than the, the MyTech Brooklyn uh, that costs 2,000 euros. That's true, it's, it's the same chip. But my car, my Mercedes, uses the same uh, petrol filter uh, as uh, a simple street car. So it doesn't say anything. The rest has to be good as well. Um, you also need um, to avoid um, problems with interfacing. If you use a wrong cable between two devices for digital connection and they have the wrong impedance, you will get losses. The, the ground loop uh, is a problem. If you, if you have equip, equipment not connected well, there will be a, a, a ground loop by a, a different potential. And um, it can be a noisy power supply that also gives a problem. I, I'll explain it later on. What you see here is what most people see as a digital signal. If the, the line is high, it's a one. If the line is low, it's a zero. The problem is it's not a digital signal. It's an analog square wave that is used to encode digital information. It's like on the submarines where they have those lights that they flicker to tell stories to each other without uh, the, the, the enemy knowing what is done. Those lights are not letters. Those lights are flashes. But they are used to indicate letters. And it's the same here. It's an analog uh, square wave that is used to encode zeros and ones. And analog signals do distort. This is a square wave, but it's not a perfect square wave for the simple reason that you can't make a perfect square wave. If I put a line here, um, you see it's not fully straight. If it was straight, it would be a miracle because you can't make perfect square waves. You need an unlimited bandwidth. So from zero hertz to 100 million hertz or more, even at 100 million hertz, it's not a perfect square wave. It would be better, but not perfect. You have the same, of course, um, here. And the time here between, between those two is the ramp up time. And of course, at the way down, it's the same story. You have, an, you have a ramp up ramp down time. Now, the idea is that uh, somewhere halfway, you decide it's a one or a zero. So uh, this is a four volt signal. Um, at two volts, it switches from zero to one. This is this point, for instance. And uh, the way down, same story, it's there. Now, if you uh, have a problem, that point shifts, shifts, and if it shifts, we've seen at the, 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 the reconstruction I, I showed you with the red line that was not straight, that there is a problem, distortion. Now, how can they occur? Jitter is carried through the digital data. It can influence all kinds of processes. Um, it can be a single frequency, like the example I showed you. It can also be noise. Um, but it can also be uh, music-dependent uh, modulation that depends on the design and how wrong it was done. Um, what you get is um, 
this is the square wave you see when there is jitter. And you, you now see that there's a problem in time. Some uh, signals uh, are earlier than others, and uh, some ones will be earlier and some ones will be later. This is the, uh, the threshold point again, and um, you see that this can be a threshold point too if the jitter is to the left. And this is to the right, and the same you have on the, on the downgoing line. Um, and then you see that you have this distance between um, the up and the, and the down, but it can also be in time here. Or it can be here. And then you get those poles shifting, and you get a red line that is not straight. This is one problem. What do you get when there is a problem with the uh, ground plane? Everything is measured uh, from the ground plane up. There is no such thing as two volts. It's over always two volts uh, compared to the ground plane. If there is a noise level of one tenth of a dB, or there is a, a, a hum because of, of, of a ground, ground loop, what you get is that in, in this example, in the ground level shifts one tenth of a, of a volt up. What you then get is again other points where the um, threshold point is and where, where uh, is decided whether it's a one or a zero. But there are these points. And now you have three different points where the, where, where the transition can be, where it is decided whether it's a zero or one. This gives enormous problem. Let me explain one thing. There's a lot to do with people that know a lot about um, um, networking that tell me this is nonsense what you say because, well, the Bank of England would have a problem if this was a problem. And they are right, but that only goes for the digital domain. The Bank of England, uh, when they go to analog, they have someone at the counter counting the money. Um, if that was done electronically, I don't know how that would go. The problem here is that you only have distortion during the digital to analog conversion. That's the only point where the problem really exists. Before that, the digital signal is, um, is safe and will not be disturbed under normal conditions. If that goes wrong, you really have faulty equipment. The distortion comes from phase noise, that, that the, 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 the clock crystal is not pre precise enough. It comes from uh, leaking current. If you have uh, devices not earthed, earthed in the right way, there will be a, a shift of the ground plane. And uh, there, there can be noise on the ground plane due to the power supply. This is one problem. There's another problem. Well, it's not a problem if you solve it. There, there is equipment that did solve this quite well. And, uh, but it's the reason why some equipment is not sounding as good as others. Um, I told you about the filtering, that at a half the sampling frequency there has to be a filtering. Well, the filter was needed to ha not have this strange staircase, but have a straight line there. And there are several ways to do that. In the beginning of the digital audio, you had what now is called a linear phase measure filter. That's a filter that gives the, uh, the, the, the reviewers that use the measurement equipment to decide whether equipment is sounding well or not. Uh, they use this. Um, it's a filter that starts at 20 kilohertz, and it goes down at 22.05 kilohertz for 16-bit. For, for 24 bits, it's even uh, 144 dB. It looks like this. It's an extremely f uh, steep filter. Um, if you want to be 96 dB down at 22 kilohertz, that's 96 per dB, not per octave, as we normally specify filters, but it's per single note, one note on the piano. Now, an octave, if you ask a musician, says it's eight tones. The problem is that they are musicians, so they count from C to C. That's not fair, you should do from C to B. So it's seven. And that's not even completely true because there are two half note distances in an octave. But let's say seven. In that case, uh, you have 96 dB 
times seven is, let's say, 700 dB per octave filter. That's extremely, extremely steep. And you can't do that well. If you want to maintain um, a, a linear phase, um, you get about 10 cycles of pre and post swinging. So when the signal starts, you already had 10 wobbly images of that same signal um, warning you that the signal is coming. We're not used to that. In nature, an echo can only come after the event and not before the event. That doesn't sound natural. So they made a different filter. They, they experimented and found out ways to, to limit the problem. Um, that's now called a linear, by some, uh, a linear phase listen filter. It still starts at 20, it doesn't start at 20 kilohertz, but somewhat lower, for instance, 18 kilohertz. It's not as steep, it's only 6 dB downs at 22 kilohertz. You then get that you don't uh, apply the rules of Nyquist in the right way, and you get a, what is called aliasing, that sounds like a, a robot voice, if you really have a serious problem. But the way this is done, they're only aliasing at very high frequencies, and that's almost inaudible. Of when it's done very good, it's inaudible. It looks like this. It's a friendly curve. What you win then is uh, still no phase shift, but you get about one cycle of pre and post echo. That looks like this. This is already better, but still, your ears are not used to hearing things before they start. So it's still not very nice. You hear it, for instance, when you uh, have a rim shot on, on a snare, it doesn't sound right. It doesn't have the bite. It doesn't have um, uh, the right place in the stereo image. Then there were people that said, well, what happens if we lose the perfect face behavior? What if we have a small deviation, deviation in face in the high frequencies? They, again, had a measure filter to start with. Uh, it starts at 20 kilohertz. And this is an error. It's 6 dB down at 22 kilohertz. Uh, it looks like this. And um, it has no pre-ringing, but has twice as much post-ringing. Since that's more natural, still not ideal, but it's more natural, already sounds a lot better. Um, and you do have some, some varying phase response at high frequencies, I said. And the pre-bringing from the recording is also a bit filtered out. Because at the recording, about the same happens. You have to have a, a, a filter at 20 kilohertz to record at 44.1 kilohertz. There's a guy called Peter Craven that published a lot about this. And um, he called this filter an apodizing filter. And Peter Craven is one of the people behind MQA. And that's one, from the, one of the reasons why, with affordable equipment, you can get a much better re results if you use the MQA uh, implementation in the DAC. The signal looks like this, then. So you have a signal, you have a lot of echoes. You, you don't hear them as discrete echoes because they're too close together. But it's, it's, it's not ideal, but it's better than having a pre-echo, to my taste, and, at least. Then there was someone who said, well, we, we can improve that by uh, filtering at a, at, a, at a milder slope and taking, the, like the one we did with the, with the uh, uh, linear phase filter, uh, we say, well, we, we accept some, some aliasing and uh, we use that uh, to, to uh, have a friendlier behavior. It looks like this. And uh, when you then go back to uh, the ringing, there's no pre-ringing, it's the same as the, uh, the previous example, but there's only a little post-ringing, and you have a varying phase at a higher frequency, like, like the previous, and that's, when it's done, not really audible. But it sounds a lot natural, because you don't have any pre-ringing and only a little post-ringing. Then you can do another trick, and that's upsampling. If you upsample, you have a computer or a DSP calculate values in between those normal values there are. If you do that, you end up with a two times or four times higher sampling frequency. Then you're allowed 
to have a filter at a higher frequency. If you do it four times, you get, let's say, 196 kilohertz. Then you can filter at uh, uh, 96 kilohertz. And um, that's not what is done, by the way. What they do is, from 20 kilohertz, use a very slow filter. And because it's a, it's a very gradient filter, it sounds a lot better. But good upsampling needs uh, a very good uh, code in a, very, in, in a reasonably fast uh, processor. So you see that in, in uh, DACs that have uh, uh, FPGAs built in. You can do it in your computer. It's, it's a bit of a fuss, but you can do that. And um, if it's done in, the, in, the, in a chip, in a DAC chip that is often used, then it's quite poor because the, the comp computational power of uh, a DAC chip is very limited. And therefore, there's, a, there's a, an in-between where the calculation can be done by a small processor outside of the, the DAC chip, and then um, it's, it's a good compromise. Let's wrap it up by saying digital audio is robust as long as it's digital. All digital audio to analog conversion jitter is critical. To find jitter, money is the main factor. It's no other way, uh, it costs money. And during the conversion, the reconstruction filter is critical. The quality of the re reconstruction filter differs greatly amongst uh, components. And if you buy a, a 100 euro Chinese deck, don't expect that to, say, to sound the same as a 1,000 euro um, uh, quality deck. Because a good filter design is complex and uh, costly, and you need a designer that is very capable of doing that. I'll be back next Friday at 5 p.m. Central European time. If you don't want to miss that, subscribe to my channel or follow me on the social media so you will be informed when new videos are out. Help me reach even more people by giving this video a thumb up or link to this video in the social media. It is much appreciated. Many thanks to those viewers that support this channel financially. It keeps me independent and lets me improve the channel further. If that makes you feel like supporting my work too, the links are in the comments below this video in YouTube. I'm Hans Beekhuizen, thank you for watching and see you in the next show or on the HBproject.com. And whatever you do, enjoy the music.